perhaps one of the best places to start is to see if we can give a sort of a, a generalized and working definition of this thing that you've referred to as capitalism or liberalism. I think that that uh, capitalism can probably, um, in terms of describing the function of the system, can probably be best described uh, in Marxian terms uh, as a as a particular um, system that exists based upon certain technological factors. So in other words, capitalism didn't always exist and, uh, and capitalism uh, won't always exist in the future. And uh, so this, this parallels uh, an understanding that the liberal doctrine of the end of history uh, put forward uh, by Francis Fukuyama at, uh, at uh, California University of Stanford University rather, um, put forward in his thesis in his book, The End of History. And uh, he was a so-called Hegelian, or, or rather used Hegelian framework to describe that. I've, I've seen him in a few interviews actually backtrack from describing himself thoroughly as a Hegelian. He's also actually publicly now a uh, step back from his end of history thesis or say that it's been misunderstood um, by the public. So he, he actually now himself admits, and I think this is a huge step forward that Fukuyama himself admits that um, this is not the end of history. So that raises the question of what's next. So we need to explore different political, social, religious, and ideological movements that are going on in the world to understand them um, from a non-advocacy perspective, um, especially considering uh, that number one, to be you know, more rigorously scientific, one should, should try to approach questions without a, as many uh, a priori assumptions as possible, and secondly, under these conditions of extreme censorship uh, and really political repression that is that is in, in full swing in the West, it, it's really impossible to be fully an advocate of, of any of these you know large established existing groups that that maybe might be under sanctions or might be associated with uh, with uh, interfering with the United States election process or something like this. So. Um, it is, you know, so I would say that that to answer your question directly, that that um, one way to define liberalism that is very useful is that it is the ideological framework of capitalism, um, and uh, and then that capitalism is the is the economic system uh, based upon uh, the accumulation of surplus value, but is also uh, in the period of of late modernity uh, increasingly a simulacrum economy. Uh, that, in other words, it's moved away from uh, industrial production, which which relied on a, a strong consumer base and a full employment society, and moved towards moving towards a uh, a fictional economy that's rather speculative in nature, and where the uh, value of the economy is uh, driven by fiat, and uh, where uh, currency has been continually debased. And that the um, that the framework is is increasingly psychological, and it digs very deep. And so, the more that we enter into this economic period of of late liberalism or or neoliberalism, the more that it must rely upon uh, the most advanced methods of of social psychology and social engineering, in order to uh, maintain uh, an unjust hierarchical system. Um, which is not to say that hierarchies are innately um, unjust, but that there are unjust hierarchies. And, um, and I think this is a distinction that should be made here. Yes. And so when looking at, um, at liberalism, uh, it really um, takes its roots in um, what I will call uh, naive empiricism. And, uh, and that, that, that results, of course, in, in many things that many people have written about um, better than I could say it, of course. Um, but really, man is primarily economic man is one of the results, but also um, um, man deprived of his, of his intuitions. So when you reduce, um, when you take an epistemological framework um, that says that knowledge is purely derived uh, from your six senses, I guess it's six because your ears can determine that you're falling. So um, if you have six senses, um, because the cochlea, uh, you have um, really that's the, the basis for understanding the world and that this really greatly delimits um, many things that are um, intuitive and, and also um, doesn't properly recognize 
the process of, of cognition and the, and the cognitive process that's involved in interpreting um, this, this empirical data. And so it also leads to a, a certain um, proscribed um, ontological framework as well. So the whole worldview of liberalism can actually be um, pinpointed really in its origins and in, in my view uh, in, in the beginning of, of naturalism. Yeah. And um, naturalism itself was not a problem. And all of the original um, naturalist scientists and philosophers were also deists or, or deeply religious, in fact. And, um, and what, they, they, what they thought they were doing is they were understanding how God's mind worked. Um, and so it was a very useful um, thought experiment um, because in the, um, in the Dark Ages, um, which I wouldn't say were, were dark, but in yeah. that period of time, um, there, there was definitely um, pr prior to, to, to in, in, I guess we would say in the, in the mainstream historical narrative, prior to the reintroduction of the, of the Greek classics uh, through the European interaction with the Arab world, um, that the um, uh, religious view um, didn't um, dig into certain questions in a certain way. And so while it was perhaps accurate to say that it's raining because God wants it to rain, um, that was a shortcut that didn't really describe you know, the nature of cumulus clouds and condensation and things like this, right? So, so science began to understand you know, how God's mind works. And then along the way, um, it developed and sort of went, went in a different direction and it became codified that science meant that you describe the world um, in the absence of, of, uh, of consciousness. But in fact, when we look at, and I, I don't want to, to um, prolong my answer, um, but when we look at consciousness itself, um, the fact that we are thinking and that we are conscious beings is a very profound thing. We are, we are you and I right now are, are two entities in the physical realm that are conscious and, and, and having this, this dialogue right now. And I think that, that this alone is, when we think about how profound that is, it really is an amazing thing. And yet, the, so what happens in, in the sciences is that they develop along this naturalistic path uh, in which things must be described um, without agency, that there's no agency involved in processes. Now, I think that's very useful when you're describing um, gravity, it's very useful when you look at, you know, the, the orbits of planets and so forth, like, um, or molecular uh, processes as well. Um, but what they've done with this naive empiricism is they've applied it to political processes and social processes. And this is very dangerous because we know that in geopolitical, political, and social, and sociological processes, um, consciousness is involved. There are leaders and people with power making decisions and all of the results that they're getting today are the result of the, the highest and most advanced levels of the development of social psychology, sociology, and geopolitics and so forth. And so, but what happens in, in liberal academia and the way that the, the world is now described is that they apply this naturalistic version of describing um, uh, non-conscious non or, or, or uh, matter without agency um, naturalistic processes, and they apply these to explaining, you know, uh, things like wars or, or things like social policies. And, and so, so we're forced to look at things as being a perfect storm when we know that, they're, that human beings are conscious and they are making decisions. And so the liberal paradigm has taken us to a place where, where now when you describe um, processes that are taking place that are, that are, that are discernibly um, driven by decision makers, um, when you begin to describe the decision processes, when you begin to describe um, possible motives of the, of the decision makers, this now falls under the, the unfortunate category of conspirology. And so that is really how we can get, you know, understand the, how liberalism as a paradigm um, creates a simulacrum that it's not an ideology and it, and it ports over some very useful things from the natural sciences and applies them to the humanities and it's very dangerous. Well, that was a remarkably sophisticated response to a very complicated question. I appreciate that very much, Joaquin.